Uh, please tell us to start off with a little bit about the bonobos and how you came to be uh, acquainted with them, how you, how you found out about them. Right. Well, bonobos, just in case you don't know a bonobo from a banana, Fair are way. the make love, not war chimpanzees who swing through the trees as well as with each other. You know, bonobos are our closest living relatives, the closest to human of, of um, all the other non-human animals. And uh, we're both great apes, humans and bonobos. And, you know, some people say common chimps are equally close to humans as bonobos. Uh, both common chimps and, com and, and bonobos are closer than gorillas or orangutans. But some people lately are saying bonobos are closer. I'm not a primatologist. I'm a sexologist. I know I like bonobos better because, um, well, a lot of things. But, one, bonobos have a lot of sex. That's why the make love part. And, uh, you know, the sex seems to lead to the not war part. They also make, uh, they make peace through pleasure. My phone is ringing. Let me yes, take it is. my receiver off. Okay. How, how did you so, the And then the females, the I got to say, before you go on, females rule Bonoboville. Okay. But the males are happy. The males love it. So it all works out for everybody. But the, the females are pretty much in charge. Do you think that's a positive thing that humans should imitate? I think it's a very positive thing. And like I said, the males are happy about it. I, I think that's very important. I think that a lot of humans seem to see it as a zero-sum contest of some sort, where if the females get power, the males lose power. And among bonobos, you can see that with the females more or less in charge of a lot of important things such as food sharing, pretty much such as sex, uh, but the males are in charge of some things like protecting the tribe uh, and other things. Uh, it, it's more or less egalitarian, which is very unusual among apes. Most apes are patriarchal. The males are in charge of everything, and the females get raped quite a bit. But among bonobos, rape is rare, and murder pretty much non-existent. Uh, there's never been seen a bonobo killing another bonobo in the wild or captivity. And it seems to have something to do with all the sex and with the females being in charge and with the males being happy. And you first, um, you first came and became aware of the bonobos watching television with your husband, Max. Could yeah. I, um, it's not very I, exciting. It's not like I was walking through the jungle. No, I was just watching television in the old days when people watched television instead of just looking at their phones. But, yeah, I was um, watching a PBS special called The Nature of Sex. It was 1993, and I loved to watch all the different non-human animals have sex. It was very inspiring. I was a newlywed, and I had a great sex life, but most newlyweds do. And I was just thinking, gee, you know, how are we going to keep this going? What What is this all about? And I don't know. I just didn't find much inspiration in anything I was reading or hearing. And then I see these great um, videos of animals having sex, which was really exciting. It just made me feel connected to the earth, very ecosexual, connected to all the other animals. And then the last night, the last non-human animal that they covered was the bonobos, and I never heard of them. And suddenly, I'm seeing these creatures who look just like me and my Aunt Harriet. I mean, everybody in the family, except maybe a lot hairier. Well, I mean, you're pretty hairy. So yes, humans are hairy as bonobos. But mostly, they are hairier than humans. But otherwise, I mean, their physical structure, very similar. And watching them have sex, seeing them do it like we do it, was just so revelatory. And then hearing the announcer say, not only do they have a lot of sex, and it's not for procreation purposes only, it's also for recreation and relationships. I, I was just like, wow, this is like humans. This is interesting. And then they said, they don't kill each other. And I was like, oh, wow, this connects with my anti-war side that I've had since I was a kid. And 
I just felt like, wow, the, the, this is something I can be inspired by in my own relationships, in my own sex life, and maybe sharing it with others. There's a key part, though, about the uh, bonobos' sex life is that they are non-monogamous. Yes, that's the this- key part. I was married. They don't get married. They might have a favorite friend, but they have a, different partners. Uh, first of all, you know, one thing that's interesting about bonobos is they love to have sex with their friends. But even more, they like to have sex with strangers. <laughs> they love strangers, you know, and they love to share food and sex with strangers. And it's a way of connecting. I think we humans we feel a lot of the same impulses, but we repress them for various reasons, some good, some bad. But bonobos, they they love strangers, and somehow they seem to know how to balance things so that they don't get too jealous. It's, It's not like they're, you know, some other complete creature than us. They do get jealous, but they work it out. They uh, calm each other down with sex, with affection, with empathy, uh, and and they all seem to understand that it's not just about one partner, that you can share love with different partners. And pretty much all bonobos are what you might call bisexual, maybe pansexual is a better word, because they their Latin term is pan paniscus, and pan, sure. of course, is the Greek god of the wild. Sure. Pan has been given a very bad rap ever since the Christian church basically turned him into the devil because he was just so popular among the people, part goat with horns and hooves and a tail. And he would play his little flute thing and have all kinds of sex. And yeah, he was a bad boy. Sometimes he you know, kind of ran after some nymphs that didn't want it. But usually the nymphs were able to turn themselves into trees or something before they got raped. But in any case, he was very pro-sex, sex sex positive, and uh, and very pro-animal and reminded humans that we're not so different than the other animals. And I, I guess I feel that this is a great sort of uh, patron saint of the bonobos, pan. And pansexual means you just have sex with different people, or if you're a bonobo, different bonobos. And it could be male, could be female. Uh, you know, if you're human, could be something in between. And and that's all okay. Have you gone on to explore non-monogamy yourself and pansexuality? Yes, well, I always explored that. I mean, I, I've been a swinger. I mean, I, I still consider myself kind of a soft swinger. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't go in for the hardcore swinging I used to. Uh, maybe it's my age. I don't know. But I, I do believe that it's important to interact erotically with other people. I've been married for 27 years. That's what I was and going I to ask. Yes, cherish yes. my marriage to my prince, my my captain, Max, and he is a partner with me in everything I do. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's turned on by my uh, interactions with other people. Do you think more relationships and more people would be happy if they knew what you guys have done and explored this and just uh, embraced it without, uh, without too much jealousy and such? Well, I think that humans are all different. I mean, I'm a sex therapist in a private practice, and there are very different lifestyles that we humans have all over the world. I do think we need to acknowledge our essential non-monogamy. Now, that doesn't mean we all have to be swingers. That doesn't mean we all have to be polyamorous. I don't think it works for everybody, but it works for a lot of people. And for others, where it maybe doesn't work because of their religion or just they're just not into it. But I do think it always helps to acknowledge that humans are essentially non-monogamous. And uh, I've always felt that kind of in my bones. And if I was a man, I guess I'd say in my boner. Uh, But uh, I, I guess 
I was inspired more reading uh, Dr. Chris Ryan's book, Sex at Dawn, which talks about early humans who were a lot like bonobos and uh, in, including the, the somewhere between polyamory and swinging and non-monogamy, you know, sharing partners in different ways, uh, not making monogamy uh, a kind of requirement. I guess, you know, sometimes you just want to be with one person. And bonobos are like that, too. They might just want to be with one bonobo for like two weeks, you know, <laughs> and that's it. And, and I mean, you know, you just get into somebody. But then you want to spread out, you know. Um, apes are are kind of social creatures. And our sexuality is social, too. Uh, you know, but there's such a thing as the bonobo handshake. A handshake in and of itself is at least a vestige of the old days when, I think, we used to do like bonobos and hold each other's genitals. Uh -huh. to say, yes, I like you. I can be trusted. You can trust me with my balls in your hands. In fact, the word testify is related to the word testicles because when a man back in old Bible times, before there were Bibles, used to testify, he would hold the other man's balls in his hand and say, I swear on your balls. Or maybe he'd do it on his own balls. I swear on my family jewels that I will do whatever you want me to do. And, uh, and, and this became, you know, putting your hand on the Bible because, of course, the repression, the, the idea that sexuality is somehow associated with evil, that idea that Pan is the devil, that idea that um, we've got to be monogamous. And usually by we, they mean the woman. I mean, throughout history, men have been non-monogamous and not suffered too much. But when women have been non-monogamous throughout history, they've been chastised and killed and punished and yeah. uh, ostracized uh, in all different ways. And, I mean, it goes back and forth, and there are different societies that practice different cultural traditions. But in general, it seems that since the advent of farming and private property, that, you know, when you own a piece of land, then you feel like, well, I got to own some people too. And I certainly got to own my wife. Yes. Because otherwise, I don't know if her kids are mine. See, bonobos don't know whose kids are whose. So all the bonobo boys are great uncles. They're fabulous. They love the kids. They don't know who's theirs. And in fact, what is this ownership thing all about? I mean, with a mother, yeah, she's got to nurse the baby and, you know, the mothers really take care of the baby. And I'm all for fatherhood and I'm not against fathers being more involved with their kids. I think it's great, especially in our society such as it is. Yes, but I do think a lot of the problems that we encounter with jealousy, with um, the feeling of ownership, possessiveness of other human beings arrive because, you know, men know where babies come from. And they figure, this is my kid, and that one's not. And that's the spell, the, you know, that, that introduces jealousy, that introduces possessiveness. If you don't know whose kids it are, these are, and you're in a community, you love them all. I saw you speak at DomCom. What do you think, the, do you think um, BDSM kind of behavior is healthy? What, where do you, th what, what place do you think it has in a, in a person's life? How do you feel about it? Well, I think it's great, and I want to give a shout out to Dom Khan and all my friends there, and especially Mistress Cyan, who is the founder and head mistress of Dom Khan. And it's uh, it's what I call a bonoboville. It's it's a community in which um, people practice sex positive activities in a in a safe space where they can combine lust and trust. I feel that bonobos have a kind of special way and a, a secret to combining lust and trust. And I think in human life, sadly, too often, trust kills lust. And lust is, um, you know, something we feel for strangers. 
And then as we get to trust someone, we start to lose the lust. And so sometimes kinky activities help us to keep the lust going and establish this really deep form of trust. And there's different activities that you can do. I mean, Tantra is a whole other field, uh, but certainly BDSM is a field, a kink, where you can practice trust and at the same time really stimulate that lust. And not everybody's into it, but I think it's very normal and natural to be into it. Uh, I mean, you know, the opposite side of the coin of pleasure is pain, and you don't want to have too much pain, but just a little bit of pain is, you know, kind of uh, like spice in your salami, but too much spoils the meat. So you don't want to have too much, and it has to be all totally consensual. That's where the trust comes in, consent. You need to establish that. And I find that the people involved in BDSM are often very good at teaching the rest of us how to establish consent because they're doing it a long time. And a lot of people, you know, nowadays in the Me Too movement are a little confused about how to establish consent, how to establish trust without losing lust. They think that lust always has to be totally spontaneous with no discussion. And yeah, that's that's great. I, I, I'm into totally spontaneous with no discussion. But on the other hand, that can be dangerous, you know, uh, and I, you know, I think bonobos do a little, they do negotiating, they do discussion, uh, they do this sharing of food and talking, you know, it's funny, bonobos, if they're trained, they can speak human language on computers and oh, through oh, sign yeah. language, but humans don't know how to speak bonobo language. So we, but I, but we know they're talking and, and so they do a lot of talking and uh, they do a lot of back and forth. And uh, so, and they do a lot of like uh, rough sex, you could say. And I think there is a form of bonobo BDSM and there, it takes different forms, just like human BDSM. Sometimes it's about fighting that turns into sex. I mean, a lot of times they fight, you know, they're not angels. They're animals, just like us. And they fight. They just have some sort of discipline. See, um, bondage and discipline. I mean, they have a sort of discipline that prevents them from killing each other. They can be pretty vicious in the fighting. I have to say, I'm, I'm not going to lie and say bonobos are angels. They're not. But anyway, they so they do this thing where they fight. And then, like, especially when the males fight, uh, they turn it into sex. They do like penis fencing and they rub their, their penises together hard or rump rubbing where they rub their big bonobo balls against each other and uh, they kiss the males and hug and, uh, and sometimes they come like that. Uh, sometimes they even do anal sex, although that's more rare, but I have seen bonobos engaged in anal fingering in the zoo. Everybody was embarrassed, even me, but because they were doing it so obviously. It's like <laughs> bonobos are intense. Let me just say, even a sexologist and a pro bonobo person like myself, you know, you could go, oh my God, I can't believe they're doing that. <laughs> it's really amazing. Uh, but body worship is a very important part of BDSM. And certainly bonobos, especially uh, the males and the females worshiping the female body, although sometimes they worship the male, you know, they, they worship each other through grooming, through licking, through playing, toe sucking, a lot of, you know, you almost call it a foot fetish. They are so into the feet and uh, ears. They do a lot of ear licking. Uh, bonobos actually don't spend all that much time on intercourse. They do a lot more outer course, you know, what I call outer course, okay. what some people might call, call foreplay, but I think that always sounds like it's secondary. And it's part of the whole idea that bonobos show us that recreational sex, whatever aspect you want to talk about it, is 
as important or more important than procreational sex. For bonobos, it's kind of more important because recreational sex, relationship sex, is what keeps them peaceful. Uh, I often say that especially the females having sex together, because they're kind of, you know, they're kind of like all Nancy Pelosi, the speaker, you know, they're kind of running things. And they um, they have this uh, sex where they rub their big bulbous vulvas together and they have clitorises and they definitely have orgasms. And uh, they, the primatologists call it genito-genital rubbing or Gigi rubbing. But I like the name that the Bogandu people call it, which is hoka hoka. Hoka hoka. Sounds a little like the bonobo tango. And it kind of is, except instead of slow cheek to cheek, it's fast, vulva to vulva action, you know, and they rub, rub, rub like this. And it's very physical, but it's also very emotional. It, it, it connects them, of course. And it's very political because they do it out in the open and the powerful females will do it with a female they like. And then other females and males know that the younger female is favored by the alpha female. And that is a very big statement that she's saying, okay, this female is very special and I am having sex with her. And so you better, you know, respect her. And uh, maybe they communicate all kinds of other things, but certainly one thing that's interesting about bonobos is that when the females are having sex with each other, they cry out in a very loud uh, moaning or hooting way. And a lot of animals do cry out when they're having sex, the female. And yet they're usually doing that when they're having sex with a male so that other males will hear. And bonobos want the other males to hear, but they also want the females to hear. That's how pansexual they are. So everybody should hear when they're having sex because when you're having sex in Bonoboville, and I use the term Bonoboville to describe bonobo communities themselves, as well as my own human community that kind of is inspired by the bonobos, yes. as well as communities like Domcon that are, I mean, since I spoke in there like six times, they're inspired by bonobos, I think, at this point. Uh, and so I think the crying out is, is really a badge of honor. It's like, yeah, I'm getting laid. And also it means I'm, good, I, I'm having sex right now with this one. Maybe I want to have sex with you later. You know, uh, I mean, one thing that's always confounded uh, human scientists and loveologists is why the males tend to come quickly and easily and females take a while, you know, in general. Sometimes females come faster, well, but usually not. So uh, one theory I'm is because they need a few males, they need a few partners before they have their orgasm. And maybe that's what bonobos do, too. The, the bonobos um, have sex face-to-face, -face too, with eye contact. Well, first of all, it was a revelation when I first saw that. And uh, I don't know if it was the announcer that explained that or a book, but I, I learned, yeah, I mean, a lot of scientists and experts in sexuality still say that humans are the only species that have sex face to face mm -hmm. that all the other species do it doggy style well yeah bonobos do it doggy style so do humans but they love to do it face to face they they probably do it face to face more often of course they do it a lot hanging from trees face to face which is a bit challenging for humans yeah. and another reason that i often say maybe for you <laughs> Yeah, maybe for, I've done it, but you know, I don't, I don't do it anymore. I, I've, I've tempered my act, but uh, I, I often say the bonobo way. Can I show my book? Yes, you, know, you should. Please, please do. Please. Uh, is is uh, not a blueprint for human life. I don't think we should imitate everything bonobos do. Like most of us should not be having sex in trees. Maybe a few of us. Or, or sleeping in trees, although, yeah, I mean, then again. And, and, and having sex with the whole family. I mean, we, we don't do that. We're not going to do that. Uh, but 
I do think we can all be inspired by bonobos. And I'm not saying everybody should be pansexual in their real life. But I think that uh, I guess it's fun to stimulate your fantasy life and understand that a lot of your wild fantasies are very, very natural and normal. Do you, as a sex therapist, do you think the fantasies and the ways people that engage in actual sex say a lot about their personalities or their lives? Do you find patterns in people? Well, I do. And I, I guess we can talk about that. But before we do, I just want to say every time I think I, I found a pattern, I find someone to break the pattern. So humans are, are very varied. But I... I you know, I think there are certain rules, I guess. We all need sex and we all need love. And some of us, and we all have different ways of expressing that. But we do need that to be fulfilled, sex and love. And just like, yeah, we all need air. By the way, I just want to say, um, <laughs> I'm not snorting cocaine. I, I have a sinus condition oh, gosh. that is uh, exacerbated by the fires in L.A. Oh, and, yes. Uh, yes. and also just the general pollution of our climate changing world. So um, I'm trying to treat it, but that's why you hear the, uh, the other animal, the frog in my voice. Uh, so I apologize. Are you pessimistic or optimistic about the future of mankind? Dr. Kind Ball. of both. I mean, I, I, I read the science and, you know, it, it looks pretty bad. I mean, it, it looks like we've already missed both. Um, so, you know, I am pessimistic. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, I, I like to be optimistic. And I, and, I, and I do believe that we have a chance. Uh, and I, I do believe there's this tremendous movement going on in the world of uh, mostly young people and, uh, and just uh, a lot of people, Jane Fonda, you know, a lot of people are striking uh, to, uh, to pay attention to climate change and to, and to make changes. I do think that we should make personal changes, small changes like recycling. Uh, but, I really think the big changes have to be made by big business and by big war. The military industrial complex is the biggest polluter. I mean, I've always been anti-war because I don't like killing people. That's right. But uh, yeah, but I didn't ever realize that the military industrial complex, the defense industry, which really is the only group that benefits from war. Nobody else benefits. I don't think uh, anybody that's not invested financially in war benefits from war. War is bad for everybody, but there are certain people, and they are the richest people in the world, and they're getting richer and richer, and they're so rich they have a disease I call affluenza that unfortunately doesn't afflict them, it afflicts everybody else. Yes. But we really need to take some of their money away. Uh, with a little good socialism, just a little money, uh, Bill Gates. By the way, Bill Gates said if he could be another animal, he'd be a bonobo. So I kind of oh. love him for that. But I, I think he shouldn't be so worried about, like, some of the lefty politicians taking his money away. Come on, Bill. He's got plenty. So anyway, uh, yeah. And I, I do believe that there's kind of a, a movement of what I call raising our e SQ. Yes, yeah, so what ask them. Please go on. Okay. It's my acronym for ecosexual intelligence. Uh, or as we say in the language of romance, intelligentsia ecosexual. Um, and it's um it's a topic that I I talked about in my keynote speech at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez when uh, they held the first symposium. Uh, on practices of ecosexuality, which was uh, directed by uh, and organized by Professor Serena Gaia Anderlini Donofrio. Um, and uh, she's um, a great uh, philosopher and humanities professor who really has been promoting the idea of ecosexuality. And I just thought, you know, 
I mean, they got emotional intelligence, they got athletic intelligence, they got engineering intelligence, they got all kinds of intelligences. Why should we have an ecosexual intelligence that is about feeling our connection to the earth in all ways, in, in, in intellectually, emotionally, and sexually? And yeah, some people like my friend, uh, Dr. Annie Sprinkle, shout out to Annie Sprinkle. Uh, she likes to actually make love to the earth, you know, real tree hugging and real like boogieing with the earth and, and the water and, 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 and they, she and her, her wife do a tremendous uh, job of raising people's ecosexual intelligence, their SQ, just because she's so amazing. But how, I don't how, think how, it has to be how, quite how, so extreme. So, Hello? I'm sorry to be uh, uh, so particular and to butt in, but you talk about her doing actual tree hugging and things. Please, at the risk of being graphic, explain that to people just because it's interesting. She She's a very sexual person. She used to be a sex worker. She kind of still is, but not so actively. And, uh, and, and she, my husband actually published her first magazines. Um, and, uh, she was in love magazine and figure and, uh, and she's always been just very sexual and, and she just got into sex with the earth, you know, whether it's rolling around in the sand naked or hugging a tree naked, I guess naked helps, but you don't have to be naked. You no. just have to feel excited. I mean, let's just put it this way. We use a vibrator yes. to get off. Why not use a zucchini? I mean, yeah, some people do. Um, I suppose nice that's just incredibly up, uh, Nature's own dildos, you know? And uh, I think there are different ways to be ecosexual. You know, uh, some of it involves fantasy and some of it involves just having sex outside and just understanding, just valuing sex and the ecology of the world uh, above greed. I guess uh, there's so much pitying us about how we'll be better sexually if we can only buy this makeup or this car, uh, or this gun. And, uh, and I think that the eco-sexuality movement uh, and raising your ESQ is teaching you to find your turn-ons in nature and, and not through just, you know, plastic and, and uh, lethal weapons. I think that's very wise. Are you happy? I'm happy. Person. Yes. I'd like to clear up my sinuses. You know, this voice. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and you know what? Sex clears up my sinuses. Let me just say it's temporary, but sex is a great healing thing. And so often we say, I'm not feeling well as a reason not to have sex. And sometimes it is. Uh, sometimes it is. But sometimes, like, I find it. it it clears up my sinuses while I'm doing it, and maybe for like a minute afterwards, then it comes back. But it also clears up a headache. I, I mean, good sex, not bad sex. Not sex when you don't want to have it. It's got to be good. But open your mind. I know that uh, there could be people watching this because of the producer that are, um, you know, concerned about pain management. Yes. And like we were saying before, pleasure and pain, opposite sides of the same coin, they're about feeling. And, you know, so often our doctors give us things to kill our pain, opioids, for instance, or, you know, other things that are less dangerous. But what about pleasure? What about saying, hey, you know, why don't you have sex? Why don't you have, why don't you masturbate if you don't have a partner? Um, I have a lot of clients who are in chronic pain and, what, I mean, they have different ways to alleviate the pain, but one of the ways is through sex. And sometimes it's just, you know, a lot of people criticize people who like jack off all day, you know, and yeah, I guess you're kind of wasting your time. You should be out there beating the pavement, making money, yes. uh, you know, or having 10 kids, you know, but 
I mean, maybe you're managing your pain and maybe you're preventing yourself from becoming a crazed incel that goes out and, you know, mass murders a bunch of people in Walmart. They're very fair, very, very fair. That's and I really point. think that when people examine violence and they don't take sexuality into consideration, it's like they're, they got blinders on. Especially since most of this mass violence, whether it's committed by individuals who are just broken or by people in the military, it's mostly by young people. It's mostly committed by horny young people, channeling their sexual feelings into violence. And that's what the military industrial complex harnesses. Be all you can be. Well, no, I mean, you could be a sexual person and, and uh, a creative person and a, a loving person. You don't have to be in the army to be all you can be. But, yeah, I guess if you're cutting off your sexuality, if you repress it and you say, I shouldn't have sex with anybody until I'm married, then, yeah, you feel like, well, maybe I should shoot a gun. Maybe what I should shoot a, a, you know, automatic weapon. What about professions that um, require celibacy? Are those healthy, do you think? Well, look at or the Catholic that, Church. That's, I mean, you know, I, that's like a, I don't even have to go into that. You know, celibacy, come on. Does it just seem unnatural? It's hypocritical. It's, it's beyond unnatural. I mean, certainly people sometimes choose celibacy. There, there's a certain part of LGBTQA, asexual, like mm -hmm. I don't want to have sex with anybody. I kind of feel like people like that, they do have a sexuality. It's just not defined the way human society defines sexuality. But, and, and celibacy too. I, I know of like, for instance, a lot of uh, submissive guys who like say, oh, put me in a chastity belt and I'll be celibate for you. Well, you're not really being celibate. You're being all turned on in the chastity belt, and you know you're 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 being submissive. I mean, I mean sometimes it's about you know playing control games with your sexuality, which is fun, and it it's part of sexuality. So I'm not against that. I'm not against people holding back. You know, sure. like um, you know forced whole. What do they call it? Uh, sperm retention, you know, not being able to come. You're not allowed to come for two weeks, you know, and and I don't think it's a great idea never to come. I don't think it's good for you physically. Oh, really? Yeah, I think it creates pro prostate cancer, and there have been studies to prove that. And of course, they always do more studies on male problems than female, but I'm pretty sure that once they do some female studies, they'll find that sexually active women with if they don't consider STDs, which of course sexually active women are more susceptible to STDs, but you know otherwise I think we're healthier. Thank you very much. Please tell us about Bonoboville. Tell our viewers about Bonoboville and how well, they might. Bonoboville is uh, is a place. It's a place that you can join online. Anybody can join from anywhere in the world, and it's also a place. On terra firma. It's my community, our community, uh, and my husband and I have been running a Bonoboville for over a couple of decades, and people, uh, you know, love, live, work, and uh, thrive here in Bonoboville, and we're inspired by the Bonobos. We're, we don't, it's not like a sex commune, but... Uh, it is not. What? It is not like a sex commune? No, no, no. I mean, people, we're very sex positive and open to sex and people have sex, but it's not like everybody has to have sex with everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, you know, we've had a lot of orgies in our time and we will continue. Uh, so, you know, we, we go back and forth uh, between high sexual activity and kind of moderate sexual activity. Never sell it, though. Uh, but uh, we we practice the bonobo way, um, and it's again not doing everything bonobos do, but always inspired by the bonobos. We're very female 
positive. I mean, the males like it, but hey, there's a female kind of at the helm. Although my husband, Max, is uh, also, he's the executive producer. And so, you know, it's not as though the females are dictators in Bonobo Girl. We share with the males, which is more than I can say for most male-run societies. The males don't usually want to share with the females. The females usually do share with the males. And when I say female, I don't just mean women. I mean, and this is uh, one of the, the steps to releasing your inner bonobo, is for males to release their inner female and for females to release their inner male. Uh, I feel that if we release the so-called opposite sex within us, we can be happier and stronger people. And uh, I don't think men are from Mars and women are from Venus. I think we're all from this beautiful, wild, sexual planet Earth. I think we have some differences, you know, uh, and those are very interesting and important differences. But... We're far more alike than we are different, and we all need sex, and we all need love, and, uh, you know, we all need each other. Now, Bonoboville, would a person or a couple be able to, or even, you know, more than a couple, a, a group of people if they wanted, would they come in for an afternoon, or would they stay? Is it a place where you might be able to stay a period of days? Yeah, you could stay here. Uh you can stay in Bonoboville, uh, and also Saturday nights we do a show and sometimes have a party after the show, and very cool. sometimes the party is like an orgy. Oh, that's very, very cool. Very cool. So well, couples think, come, you know, what's that and, uh, and we, we it, it varies. It varies. Sometimes the shows are very serious and like interviews like I'm doing with you, and sometimes they're very wild and with swingers and porn stars and everybody having sex and squirting. In Bonoboville, we, we do a lot of things. And one of the things we do is publishing. And of course, most of what we publish is on the internet. And you can find it basically through drsusanblock.com. Uh, but we also actually publish magazines, uh, real print. Show us, and, please. Uh, this magazine is uh, our first uh, speakeasy journal. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Susan Block's Speakeasy Journal of Splosh and Art. You talked and about food with is, sex before. Uh, featuring, uh, well, actually, we have bonobos in here. Yes. As you can see, um, because bonobos love to combine food and sex, and they make a mess. Um, and humans don't usually want to make such a mess, but they often like to have romantic dinners, and some like splosh. And we make quite a mess here. And we being me and um, my friends, uh, Danielle Watts and Chef Be Live. <laughs> and uh, here we are kind of getting all down yeah, and the dirty. Food you have there? Yeah, there's what all the kinds of there? wild stuff going on. What food and, did you call? Um, it's like sex with food. Um, yes, and so what food did you use in the photographs? Uh, well, honestly, we use all kinds. Um, we we actually was inspired by an interview I did with the New York Post. So shout out to the New York Post because they asked me to talk about Splosh and, uh, and they wanted some footage. And so I decided to do a show about Splosh and featured Danielle and Sheffy Live and Ecor the Wolf. And uh, Gypsy Bonobo, nice. and a bunch of people. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, we used um, everything from vegan splosh, which uh, Chef Be Live made that. He's an expert vegan chef, Chef Be Live. Are you vegan? Am I vegan? No, yeah. I, I eat mostly vegetables, but I kind of eat like a bonobo. Bonobos eat mostly fruits and vegetables, but... Every once in a while, they eat meat. They are not vegetarians. And a lot of people say that that means they're not so great. And they're not, I don't know. They, I, I just think there's a big difference between eating meat and killing people, killing your fellow humans. Although I do think people shouldn't eat so many cows. Yeah. Um, and I don't eat cows that often, but I don't cut it off. I, I kind of eat everything. Uh, but 
I love vegan food. I just like it. And I think it's I like vegan food. this doesn't have any meat in it. There's no meat in the splash and art issue. Although we do have whipped cream and pies and uh, all kinds of other fudge. Oh, uh, you know, lots of uh, liquid chocolate and fun things. And the splashing does it mix everything together. It's all like chocolate. Do you like splashing, or was it not so much your thing? Do you? I love it. It's just so messy. Is, do you don't like cleaning up after? Is that the? Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, oh. I love to like lick food off of fingers, and I like share a grape between me and my husband as a yes. as a kiss, you know, or share food like that. Bonobos do that all the time, but. I think it's really fun, but I mean, I don't, I don't do it like bonobos, or I'd get indigestion. <laughs> I don't share whole meals like that. <laughs> but certainly sucking. I do a certain thing called Bonoboville communion at uh, my my shows, where I lick uh, salt off of nipples and uh, sometimes genitalia, and then drink uh, either an alcoholic beverage or a non-alcoholic beverage. Uh, but shout out to Agua, because we often drink Agua, uh, cocoa leaf liqueur. And huh? uh, yeah, so it's a we call it communion, because even though we don't subscribe to one religion, we kind of are pan-religious and worship all the gods and goddesses. But uh, it's, it, it, you know, it's a ritual, and it involves, you know, eating and licking the body. And it's uh, very intimate, but... Not all that intimate, you know. You don't have to do it just with someone you love. Just like a lot. What time is your show on Saturdays? Well, uh, it broadcasts live 10.30 p.m. Pacific time. But you can watch it anytime because uh, we archive all the shows on drsusanblock.tv or on its own blog or on bonoboville.com. We always play the most recent show on Bonoboville.com and on drsusanblock.tv you see all the shows going back years. Right. And, uh, and yeah, so sometimes our speakeasy journals are about one show, like Splash and Art, but uh, this speakeasy journal, which is a lot thicker, yes, it is, uh, is a speakeasy journal of Spank and Art. And this one, you were talking earlier about BDSM. Yes. This also has a section on bonobos. Mm -hmm. um, but it, um, it, it features all kinds of spanking and, uh, and history of spanking, the passion of medieval flogging, um, Euro spanking. Here I am celebrating Bastille Day by spanking uh, my friend Riyadh and Aaron's butt with a baguette. I don't know it's if you can show that. Tribute it's it's very good song. But uh, anyway, uh, this is Mistress Cyan spanking me. Uh, oh, and uh, I could go both ways. This is Mistress Tara Indiana spanking a Trump surrogate. <laughs> uh, anyway, we uh, this is a guy with no legs, speaking of, um, you know, kind of disabled people. Yeah, and yeah. he's spanking someone. Uh, and... Uh, and yeah, we have something in here. Oh, here's something with uh, a little for the religious people. Jesus loves my ass. Is Jesus, Jesus thinking? Oh, okay, it's on the panties. And uh, so I got bonobos in here somewhere. But in any case, there's a lot of uh, pictures from all different shows. A lot of them are pretty X-rated. Um, this one is on Amazon. Uh, the splash and art, and this one is banned by Amazon. Oh, really? So get it on my site. Go to Dr. So it seems it's much time. better. That's the one you want. Yeah, this one's got genitalia, yeah. and actually, I spank someone into squirting. This girl squirts really? all over me from just from spanking. On her, on her uh, behind, her spanking no, her behind. Spanking her behind, but her. Her vulva gets so bulbous, and her clitoris sticks out, and her G-spot sticks out, and as I spank it, she squirts. It's amazing. Yeah, sounds like a pretty good magazine. To, the human uh, body is amazing. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. All right, well, thank you. If there's anything else you'd no, like you're to welcome. Us about, please do. Now, if anyone wants to get a hold of me for sex therapy, okay. I am a sex therapist in private practice. Yeah. My telephone number is... Uh, let's see, the therapy number is 
291-9497. Call and, me. And if you'd ever like, um, I'd love to do a follow-up and visit the place. If I'd known that was an option in the first place, that's what I would have enjoyed. Oh, yeah. Well, this is just, uh, what do you call it? Foreplay. Terry.